In the summer months of 1518, a lone woman exits her home in Strasbourg, France. Under the watchful eye of the local authorities, she begins to dance. Within a few days, she is joined by dozens more, dancing, jigging, crumping in the street. But there's a problem. None of them can control it, and only death itself can stop them. And after the course of three blazing hot months, as many as 400 people drop dead in the street. But you can't actually dance until you die, right? We know about the events of Strasbourg 1518 from a physician named Paracelsus, who wrote an account of the events of that fateful summer. It began with one woman, but quickly spread to hundreds more around town. They started dancing and couldn't stop. The leaders of the town were unimpressed with this display. In fact, one of the more prominent members of this class, Sebastian Brandt, warned the pious citizenry in his book Ship of Fools of the dangers and moral follies of dance. Consider that this is a time in which religion, more specifically a soon-to-be-reformed Catholicism, was at the forefront of everyone's minds. Morality wasn't something that was separate from religious zeal. He was a killjoy, but he was just saying what everyone else was thinking. The leaders went to local doctors asking them to diagnose the dancers. And they, according to the finest medical diagnostic techniques, determined that the dancers were suffering from overheated blood in the brain. So, the town leaders decided that the best possible way to fix this issue of hot blood was to prescribe, wait for it, more dancing? Wait, seriously? Bro, that doesn't make sense. Well, we can't hold people in the past to the standards we have today. The authorities cleared out the center of town for the prescribed dance battle and shuffled everyone there so that they could <sighs> shake it off. Throw me a bone, guys. In the end, local authorities decided that doctors are hacks and obviously these people were suffering from a little too much devil worship in their diets, which they treated by forced prayer. And in an amazing 180 degrees switcheroo, banned absolutely all dancing. They also banned music in the city and carted the sufferers to a shrine for St. Vitus in a musty grotto nearby, stuffed their bloodied feet in bright red shoes, perhaps to make sure no one could see their gross bloody feet, and were made to march around a wooden statue of the saint. After a few weeks of constant marching and prayer, the dancing plague of Strasbourg came to an end, and those who suffered returned to their homes, presumably to sit down and not dance. John Waller, a journalist for The Guardian, writes that there were two main explanations for this phenomenon with varying degrees of credibility. Claviceps purpurea, or ergot, was the first theory. But how could a fungus force people to dance in the streets until they die? Well, as it turns out, Ergot is not only poisonous, but its consumption produces a distinct hallucinogenic effect. In fact, the drug lysergic acid dithylamide, otherwise dubbed by the Beatles as Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, is a semi-synthetic form of ergot. There are two main forms of ergotism. Type 1, gangrenous, is marked by a buildup of fluids in the limbs, loss of sensation, and if left untreated, loss of the affected tissues. Type 2, convulsive, is characterized by paranoia, hallucinations, and muscle spasms. Ergot commonly grows on rye, and the claim is that Strasbourg's grain supply had likely been contaminated with this hallucinogenic fungus, thereby producing the curious side effect of a sick medieval dance battle to the death. How could eating a little bit of funny fungus make people think you were worshipping the devil? Well, to give one example, many point to ergot as a way to explain the witch hunts in New England. In her paper, Ergotism, The Satan Loosed in Salem, Linda Caporale, PhD, argues that the growing conditions for rye along the Atlantic were perfect, and it was likely that rich landowner Thomas Putnam's grain stores had been contaminated, therefore inadvertently infecting the entire town since taxation was paid in provisions, and his contaminated grain was given to the community stockpile. Caporale brings up Mary Sibley, one of the victims in Salem, who, in order to prove that she had been bewitched by a witch cake, fed said cake, which was made primarily from rye from the local grain stores, to a dog, which subsequently began convulsing. The point is that ergot hallucinations could result in a diagnosis of devil worship, to be treated by 200 milligrams of some really good prayer. This could explain the case of the dancing plague. However, it's very unlikely that ergot infected individuals would have danced for days on end let alone until they drop dead. 
If you've ever seen someone have a motor seizure, you'll know that it doesn't look all that much like dancing. Mass Psychogenic Illness, or MPI, formerly referred to as mass hysteria. The latter term has generally been phased out of our vernacular because, well, it's sexist. It comes from the Greek word hysterikos, meaning of the womb. So, from its origin, hysteria was a mental illness that was exclusively diagnosed in women. There are two different kinds of MPI. Anxiety MPI can be identified by dizziness, headache, fainting, and overbreathing, and is often triggered by odors of other phenomena that can be seen as harmful. Motor MPI is identified by twitching, shaking, trouble walking, uncontrollable laughing and weeping, communication difficulties, and trance states and is often triggered by long-term stress and will fade when the stress has subsided. The theory is that the dancing plague of Strasbourg was an incident of mass psychogenic illness, triggered by the long-term stress of rigid and strict religious orders. People were constantly worried about whether or not something they were doing was sinful and questioning if it would bring down God's holy wrath. So when a young woman began uncontrollably dancing in the street, her neighbors, who were already keenly aware of the political and moral undertones of dancing, would ascribe sin to it. Then they'd go home, reflecting on all the bad things they had done, and worry night and day if the same fate would befall them. Eventually, at the intersection of their own perceived failings and the punishment they thought they deserved, their legs would begin to jive. God was making them dance just like that other girl, and that was a fact. What, bro? That doesn't make sense. How could stress make someone dance until they die? Stress expresses itself in different ways. Sometimes it's in obvious, clear-cut ways, like sweating or muscle tension. And sometimes you get an entire convent of nuns climbing trees and meowing like cats. What? what? Sorry, uh, let me reiterate. Stress physically manifests through- Bro, obviously we want to know about the meowing nuns. Convents prior to the 17th century saw multiple incidents where the nuns living on site would writhe, convulse, foam at the mouth, make obscene gestures and propositions, climb trees, and, most importantly, meow like cats. Many of the symptoms were consistent with what theologians and exorcists of the time believed were signs of demonic possession. In fact, Dr. Robert Bartholomew, in his paper Protean Nature of Mass Sociogenic Illness, argues that many of these convents housed young women who were typically coerced by their elders into joining, and much of the rigid discipline included disproportionate punishment, including flogging and solitary confinement. Bartholomew claims that these are the perfect conditions for incidents of MPI. Humans are social animals after all. Sometimes this works against us, as we see with the dancing plague and the meowing nuns. But by and large, these social imperatives ingrained in us help us navigate a dangerous and complex world, just like how crumping is a dangerous and complex dance. Now that we're done filming, do we want to think about what we want for dinner? How about some enchiladas? Oh! Ha! Nice. Or char grilled chicken. Or maybe a brewed coffee. Bo! Oh, you stink! Okay, well, since apparently you two are the pun lords now, you can make dinner for yourselves. Hold up! Are you letting us use the kitchen again? W I mean, you've been good about not setting things on fire lately. Oh my god! I can't wait to dust off my Gordon Ramsay cookbooks! Or, or maybe something hot and fiery. Hmm, I think I'll come to regret this. Hey, cooking's just control burning. And me, I'm the master of roasts. See my next masterpiece on the hill. <laughs>